Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this presentation. Uh, I have the pleasure uh, to have today with me this uh, great panel. We are going to discuss about the benefits of, inter of inner source in the Euro European industry. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Izquierdo. I'm, I'm, I'm here as president of the inner source commons. I have other hats. We can discuss about them later. Um, Wolfgang. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wolfgang Gehring, and I am a FOSS ambassador, and I lead the OSPO at Mercedes-Benz Tech Innovation. Hi, everyone. My name is Claire Dillon. Um, I'm a member at Intersource Commons. I'm also a researcher uh, researching the topic of Intersource at the University of Galway. Hey, my name is Georg Grütter. I, am, I work at Robert Bosch. I've done Intersource since 2009, and I'm still enthusiastic about it, which is why I'm here, I guess. Okay, uh, we would like to kick this whole thing off by activating you a little bit and also get to know you. Uh, I love to play the humming game. Anyone knows the humming game? I've seen it before? Okay, it goes like this. Excellent, yeah. Uh, I put up a statement um, and then I do like this and then you go like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, if you agree to the statement or you remain silent if you don't. And maybe you know this from the ITF. I think they do something similar. Uh, so let's have a little sound check first for me. So um, it's great to be here. Okay, you got it? Or I'm just here for the free lunch. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> That's good. I guess a good thing, <laughs> good thing that, that was scheduled in the that morning was, then, I guess. I think that was Gail. He, he, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so but now the two questions really. I know what inner source is. Mm -hmm. Okay, probably makes sense to add a little. So that's like the definition is really short. It's very simple actually. Open source, no, sorry, inner source is the open source working model and the open source culture applied inside a corporation. That's it. It's open source, only much smaller. Okay, second question. Who has done inner source? No, sorry, I have done inner source before. That's interesting. So it sounds like more people have done it than knew what it is. <laughs> uh, in fact, my company only knew that we were doing inner source six years in. That's how, that's how we learned. Oh, it's called inner source. Interesting. And the last one, the last statement. Uh, we should all rather be doing open source rather than inner source, by default. Interesting. I would say no, but maybe that's the discussion for later on. So much for that. Thanks for participating. We have an idea now. That some of you know what open source, inner source is, so we won't bore you with the basics, I guess, right? Yeah, I guess. Anyway. But indeed, Thanks. let's... Yeah. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you for participating. Um, so let's start. First of all, um, this is one of the first questions we have, and please, if you have any question or, or so, please interrupt us, raise your hand, so this could be like a good conversation altogether. Uh, but, okay, why do people choose to do inner source? Well, I mean, I can, I can tell. First, yeah. uh, I guess it's a question of why do people choose inner source, like developers, and why do companies choose inner source? I guess two yes. different things. Mm -hmm. I, as a developer, want to do inner source because it's just awesome. It's way more humane than any other development method I've experienced in the past. And I've had 35 years, so this, this was the one that made the difference for me. As a company, it's, I think, mostly about collaboration, right? trying to break up silos, even though I say you can't really break them up. You can make them more permeable, perhaps. But that's totally worth it. So collaboration across the whole company, leveraging all the talents that you have, rather than the one that's sitting next to you or is in your silo. That is so powerful, because also the companies, I know at least the traditional ones, are really heavily siloed. And we're basically, if we, would, if we were able to break that up, it would be unbeatable, especially the big ones. That's how I look at it. Anyway, collaboration. But it's a short answer. What, what, what does it mean for you specifically collaboration? It's about the space, it's about time, it's about... It's about collaborating with people who have the same interests, who are not in the same office, who are maybe in another country, who maybe work at a different time zone, not even parallel to myself. It's about you know collaborating with them, learning from them. That's the best thing because you always learn something. As a reviewer of pull requests, to be concrete, you learn sometimes more than the guy who actually submitted the pull request. At least that's what happened to me. So it's, for me, it's about learning, it's about interacting with people who, have, who are like-minded, share the same interests. It's yeah. perfect, isn't it? Maybe this sounds familiar to the audience because, yeah, this, this looks like, this sounds like open source, right? So it's about learning from each other that are basically everywhere around the world. And learning from, from them, mentoring, being a mentee, having a journey all together, having a mission together, and, and learning from each other. This leads probably to your specific use case, right? Well, uh, one of them anyway. So yes, exactly. That sounds a lot like open source, but um, maybe a reason for individuals as well as companies could be to 
practice open source. You know, maybe you're not ready yet to go open source. You don't know exactly yet what that means in the outside world. Maybe you are a bit afraid still that the world is going to see my code and my things. So you can just say, well, let's stay in a confined space that I am familiar with. Let's practice the, this in, in inner source first. And then when we're ready, we can go open source. So that could be another use case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, kind of the journey into open source. Okay. Yeah. Claire. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's really interesting. When I started working with Inner Source Commons about five years ago, we heard a lot about organisations doing it for collaboration purposes, or organisations doing it on, as a step on a path to open source readiness. Um, one topic that perhaps hasn't been top of the list, but is coming out as top of the list when we do our surveys, is that point that you mentioned, Georg, about shared learning. And I think when you think about the open source models and, and practices brought into a company, you're talking about code being visible to everyone, you're talking about better documentation, you're talking about access for people to be able to give contributions wherever they want to across the organization, you know, sometimes if, if that's the way you set it up. Um, and, and what the what the folks doing it report back is that the biggest benefit they're experiencing is that shared learning, which I think is really interesting because, you know, sometimes we talk about the, the end goal of either open source or inner source being the code, being the output, being even the, but, but sometimes I think what, what, what we're finding is actually some of it is the experience. And in, in a time and place when learning and development budgets are being cut, there's less opportunities for people maybe to find new ways to do learning. But when you can look at someone else's code and find out how they've done it, you learn from that. Um, and more importantly, actually, even that networking piece, the idea of actually meeting people from other parts of the organization who have different, who have similar, but perhaps different sets of experience and maybe know how to do things differently. Inner source gives the ability for people to interact across an organization. In a, in, a, in a kind of a constructive way or you know, a kind of a formulated way um, that mightn't be there otherwise. And that sort of thing facilitates shared learning and facilitates networking and an ability to actually even develop people's um, careers and their experiences within an organization. So I, I found it really interesting that that came out as the number one thing repeatedly in our surveys, even beyond the idea of you know, collaboration or open source readiness. So. It's, I think it's something that people want to do, and, and InnerSource gives them, lets them scratch that itch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, going back indeed to, to what Georg mentioned, right, about uh, having a space, having the, the opportunity to collaborate with others, um, that's something that might be surprising if you are simply working in the open source way or in, in companies that are producing open source, because that's not the usual way to work uh, within large corporations, right? So uh, that, and, and, and most of this, and probably something that we should stress, is a lot about cultural change. It's about learning how to move from an environment where you are you know, uh, having strong ownership, hiding perhaps to have certain power into a, an, uh, a movement, uh, a world where you, you are sharing, right? So you are growing with others. Um, and that's quite important. To, to try to land a bit more what this inner source looks like in your organization. So what, what is a good practice? Uh, uh, something that you would like to highlight from uh, specifically Mercedes-Benz in this case. Okay, um, so that's a, a, a long, I can, okay, I can say too much. Let me, let me fo try to focus here a bit. So, let's, let's okay, bring, let's so, so basically, you know, you, could, you can go two approaches in, in terms of what code should be open source, which repositories you want to open. You can say, everybody open all of your repositories to make them visible for everyone in the company. Maybe except for you know really confidential stuff, but everything else open. Or you can say, uh, we'll do it in a bit more controlled fashion and only open certain repositories that are potentially successful in resource projects. And potentially successful in this case meaning other people will use your code and contribute to it, right? So the first one, open everything, that you'll have a lot of open repositories and it will be difficult to discover useful stuff <laughs> from which you can learn. But people will say, but if I have access to everything, I can decide which from which I can learn. The other one approach is more controlled. Only those repositories that are fit for sharing, that have a good documentation, for example, that are well structured, uh, will be open to, to people. Now, if we look at that second, we actually do a bit of both, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Like we tell people, uh, make them fit for sharing your repositories, but open as many as you can, okay? 
but what we see, which are the ones that are successful? Successful in the sense people use it and people uh, 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 contribute as well. Those are the ones that scratch other people's itches. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, we have one one inner source project that is very successful. It has a community of more than 1,300 people in in the Mattermost channel, and they get like within. A, nine months or so, they had about 100 contributions from outside. Contributions, like code contributions even, yeah? Uh, also issues and bug reports and things like that. So that's an infrastructural project that so many people need and want to use. Yeah, so it's useful for them. And while you're at it, oh, there's a bug, I fixed it, yeah? So that works, but for projects that are just interesting, you know, people won't use it because they don't have the time to, okay? So fit for sharing uh, means scratch other people's itches. A lot of people can use it, and at the same time, it's maybe company internal stuff, because if it's not company internal stuff, why not open source it? All right, so these are the two main criteria for a potentially successful inner source project, from my point of view. Yeah, I want to I want to add into that because it was it was a it was a lively discussion in one of our community calls over at Inner Source Commons about what does make a successful Inner Source project, um, and there is of course the point of view if 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 what you're measuring is inbound contributions and those kind of collaborative instances across the organization, then absolutely. But what you've just said is, you know, you want to make sure that those projects are best set up to succeed in that respect. Um, and I remember one, one of our community members said, but actually that's not the only measure of success because if you think about it, when you have a project that is open, so it's visible to others, everyone else in the organization, and there is an expectation uh, to some degree that some documentation is provided, and you are helping people understand the whole practice of mentorship and the practice of um, uh, reviewing code reviews done in a formal manner, then just by doing that, even if they're not getting inbound contributions, the quality of that code will improve. So it's, it's a well-known fact in open source in particular that when you, when you put code out that's visible, people care more about it being higher quality code, right? Because they don't want to be embarrassed by what they're putting out there. Um, that happens internally too. So actually, I, th I fully agree. Like, you, you, I mean, you know, everyone gets excited about these amazing inner source projects that get you know hundreds of contributions, and they're prime examples of cross silo collaboration and all this sort of thing. Um, but there is an advantage, even if you're not getting inbound contributions. There's an advantage to having documentation, to doing things like documenting the processes by which you're making decisions, by the processes by which you know what changes have been made in the code, why. I mean, if you're not doing inner source as a practice, those sort of things sometimes slip, right? They're, they're, not, the, they're not the things that are given priority. But if there is a focus on that culture of, of the same kind of culture that's in the open source community, embedded throughout the organization, then number one, all those folks are building better code. And number two, they individually are better able to participate in open source if that ever comes about as well. So I think there's benefits beyond yep. to inner source that are even beyond the idea of successful, you know, inbound in, contributions. Yeah, yeah, that's why I said in that sense. In that, that sense, if, if you that's one of that successful. Exactly. Yes, but absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so. Actually, to add on that, I mean, there's one thing that we were two things really that we were surprised with uh, in our shop when we implemented inner source. Um, so when we started, the motivation for management and also our promise in the project was we in increase efficiency, right? It's about money in the end. But what we learned uh, while we were doing this is that innovation was actually the thing that kept InnoSource going because InnoSource was basically opening up a space in which all the red tape was gone, right? You don't have to ask permission anymore before you start something. You are the ones who get to decide how to work on the things, what to work on, what processes, what tools to use. So we were radically well, freed the developers, if you will, which is also one reason why they came to us. And then a lot of innovation happened, stuff that would have never have happened before. Uh, in fact, I know one example where someone wanted to start on you know, his pet peeve of his, and he wasn't given permission to, because there's no silo, there's no product portfolio where that could possibly fit in, right? So he just started anyway, and it actually ended up winning a CES award for Bosch. I mean because we had that free space, and that's something that InnoSource created for us. And coming back to quality, um, Especially when we said we don't use our standard quality assurance processes anymore. There was a lot of, you know, raised eyebrows in terms of how can anything come out of this that has, you know, quality that we want to associate with our brand, right? 
And the opposite happened because the developers knew much better how to achieve software quality than, I don't know, an electrical engineer who has done uh, electronic control units for the most part. And at some point, uh, business units started copying our approach, our ways to achieve quality in their business processes, which I thought was an interesting turn of events. That's another outcome of InnoSource in our shop. Well, just to, to build on this, because it was a topic we all discussed earlier as well about this idea, um, which is about this kind of peer-led innovation. Um, and again, I think it's one of the trends that is so obvious in the open source world, not as common in the in internal corporate world, is this idea that you can share best practices and, and you can share knowledge really quickly through a peer of connect, uh, connected peers, like a community of practice. So we are seeing, again, in InnerSource Commons, that even if you don't have top-down kind of management buy-in or, or a strategic OSPO or, or a, something like that that might be driving an inner source program, um, there's still a huge opportunity for communities of practice to actually share these practices within organizations. And they become sticky very quickly because people like doing it. They like connecting with like-minded peers. They like sharing innovation more quickly than might be enabled through rigid corporate structures and budget lines and all this sort of thing. And fundamentally, you know, when there's something that people want to actually get done, they need to get it done. They need to find a way. And InnerSource can sometimes provide that way for, for developers to just get shit done. Excuse my language. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but, but probably what we are seeing here is a, a flavored InnerSource depending on the, the organization, the area of the organization. So InnerSource in this case is not spread all across the organization. That would be ideal, but that will take years. Well, you mentioned, when, when did you start the inner source journey in Boss? Like 2009. 2009. So Still yeah. at it. <laughs> exactly. So it's, again, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a cultural change, right? So it takes years and, and moving forward. And, you know, there are peaks, there are valleys. And yeah, and the adding to the cultural change. So three things we struggled with at the very beginning of our inner source efforts. And the first one was the cultural change. People thought, like, yeah, it's a good idea, but... I don't know, how do I benefit from it? Why should I put the effort in and so forth? Yeah, cultural change. And the second one was um, the, the technical prerequisites weren't there because every team was developing on another platform. You know, you know te Microsoft Team Foundation Server, uh, Subversion, <laughs> um, and, and uh, Bitbucket Stash, GitLab, Git, Git Lab, GitHub, everything was there, right? And so, now we, we toned it down to pretty much two platforms, and that makes sharing a lot easier. So technical prerequisite was two. And the third one was legal prerequisites in a big corporation. That, may, that doesn't apply as much to small companies, but big corporations, multinational corporations. Um, you know, we had contracts. Like, so there's a product owner here somewhere in the big organization that is, in our case, Mercedes-Benz. And they have the exclusive right to the code you're not allowed to share that code with someone in that part of the organization. That was our situation uh, 10 years ago, right? And so you have to change some legal stuff as well and enable teams. Yeah, because we tried to share it first and I was like, uh, yeah, you can't because, oh, okay, we're gonna have to change that and we change it. Okay, talking about change, okay, what if you had a magic wand? Um, Hold on a minute. I know how to make this a little bit more serious. <laughs> We've got magic wands. Okay, here we go. Magic okay. wands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. They, they, they put me in charge of props. That's what I'm saying. Mine is pink. Okay, so. <laughs> okay. I like that. Well, anyway. Um, so, okay, now that we have a magic wand, what would you do? What would you change in Mercedes? Okay, so. Now, what I would change is um, give people a bit more time to participate in inner source activities because that's a, a, like one of the big impediments that I hear. It's like, why aren't you inner sourcing? Or, but I don't have the time to. I have so much time pressure in my own project. I can't contribute over there. Uh, I can't make my project fit for sharing. Blah blah blah. So that's that's one of the big problems. Sometimes people don't have time. Sometimes they don't take the time, as well, right? Um, yeah, but I find that a big impediment, so. 
Okay, well, if I had a wish with my magic wand, um, I think it would be to get more people to come along to the Inner Source Common Summit, which is happening next month on November 15th and 16th. Here's my pitch. So if you are interested in learning more, come along to the Inner Source Common Summit, and it's like two days of presentations from a range of experts around that. But also, because if you know people within your organizations who are not open source advocates yet, Inner Source can be this nice way to say, come along and learn about Inner Source, but Inner Source Commons itself is an open source um, project. So it can again be another way for people to actually get involved in open source matters if they're not already doing it in the open source world. So a, that's my little a remark here, uh, the summit is virtual, so you can join anywhere on Earth. Oh yeah, it's virtual, and uh, we do it. We do it in in yeah. So fifteenth and sixteenth, there's time slots that fit for the US and time slots that fit for APAC. People in Europe get both, so that's great. Such a nice closing word. I don't know how to end. No, go on, on go on. Such a wish. Uh, okay, wish. okay, okay. I'll try anyway. Yeah, you got a wand. Okay, so if I had a wish, uh, I would want the myths about inner source to magically go away. <laughs> like for instance, inner source is only there to become open source in the end. Poof on or I don't know inner source is a lot of on top effort on what you're doing already poof gone that would be fantastic wouldn't it busy, busy, busy. because my experience is that I don't know these myths are they really die don't die easily and they can be a really really big you know obstacle to inner source adoption so please go away that's my wish yeah, and oh. you have one too yeah uh, yeah but I, I want to give the magic wand to the people in the audience oh. so questions comments I just want to <laughs> I have a question, not a wish, sorry. Yeah, my question was actually to you. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about your comment on like how people adapted in the business unit adapted your approach in the software to like their working principles? I think that's like really interesting to hear. Yeah. As a as a programmer it make, made me excited to be honest. To, to elaborate on that, on that a little bit more, um, it was mostly the the fact that we do lightweight reviews. Basically, that was what I was referring to. Before that, we had like long. You know, when you do software reviews, you have long Excel lists and, and lots of criteria, and that takes all the fun out of reviewing software. And it's also not about sharing knowledge; it's just about finding the errors and using pull requests and making that an interactive process. That was what our business units learned. It's hugely, you know, beneficial. That's what that's what changed mostly. And now almost everyone's doing it. <laughs> I, I can add w one more quick one just on that because we have a case study, an interesting case study again on inner source commons slash stories, but it, it was actually Microsoft. Now Microsoft do both open source and inner source um, for code development, but this particular case study was from their consultancy department. So these were consultants out in the field and they were using it to create the materials by which they went to the customer. And they were sick of the very long process it took to bring changes to that content up through the editorial process and then down to everyone. So they created a community of practice so they could make changes from the edge. And then for, by inner source, consultants were kind of going, here's a new question that someone asked me yesterday. Um, here's a potential answer. And if it was then reviewed by the, in the, in the same way as you, you would normally review any kind of um, contribution, it got rolled out then to everyone in the organization the next day. So it basically democratized this process of doing content update, not to mind code update. Got it. Okay, so yeah, I, I have a question because I, I have been in touch with some people doing inner source, also not only open source. And, and I think that one concept that doesn't, uh, that is not easy to translate from, inner, from open source to inner source is the fact that we, we, we have uh, peers, uh, developers in, inner, in open source, developers interact as peers. Like uh, you, you really come to a community of people you you trust, and sometimes you even want to 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 enter a project because you want to work with this specific guy, etc. And so my question is, how do you translate that in inner source? Because in inner source you are inside the company, and because you are inside the company, the the hierarchical structure of the company is certainly more present. Yeah. I can I can go there maybe. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, well, disclaimer, so I'm the owner of a small company, we do inner source consultancy. So, for, for the experiences and, and getting started, let's say, in, in that sense, so we are moving from a really hierarchical company with really a strong ownership in different areas into something which is more open to give more space to, to developers. 
Um, so it's a lot about aligning product owners. So basically you have, a, what we are trying to do here is to break down the silo. So we have uh, now different product owners with slightly different requirements. So they need to agree on basically a common backlog. Once all the business layer is done at some point, what we've seen is that now it's much easier basically to get developers to work to each other. So you need to, let's say, create a bubble of business on the one side and then create a bubble of, of uh, technical developers or development in the other side. So then now you, you are starting to have developers from different business units or geographical locations just to say, okay, if I, if I need or I want to participate in this place because maybe, maybe I was said you have to do it now, I don't have to go through what we call the cheese interface, right? So I, you know, uh, did it dig, go to the boss, and then the other business unit. Uh, I just can directly go to the other backlog place mm -hmm. because everything should be open, transparent, all made explicit, processes, tools, you know. And once it's there, basically, I take the backlog that might be not prioritized accordingly to our business needs, but I now have the, I, I'm, I am now enabled to do it. I can go there. I can read the user story, I can write the code, I can send a change request. Remember that we are talking in the same way as, as we are in open source. This is zero trust environment. You are new to the community, I don't trust you. You can read everything, of course, but then uh, you are not allowed to write or to modify things. So that's the way uh, by having this defensive wall that the team receiving the contribution feels okay. They have everything according to the backlog and then developers are enabled to participate in, in that way. I, I just want to add to that because, again, anecdotally, we've heard organizations where inner source has actually helped solve that problem. So th the problem of kind of imagined ivory towers in organizations and the team that is so important that you couldn't possibly be clever enough to contribute to their code, like that happens all the time, right? It's kind of like, well, obviously no one can contribute to our code because their brains aren't big enough or whatever, you know? Um, and, and, you know, so, so that happens all the time. It's a problem in organizations because it, it actually causes succession problems within that team. It kind of creates these, you know, wizard types that everyone becomes overly dependent on. Inner source can be a solution to that problem because, wait for it, it turns out that there are loads of people with brains big enough to contribute to that piece of code. It's just they haven't ever had the chance. But when they get the chance through inner source, it turns out those organizations start going, ha, huh, look at that. That person over there was clever enough to contribute to my team. Now, not only have I got a contribution I wasn't expecting, but I also have a succession plan and a hiring potential if I ever need to expand my team. So anecdotally, we're hearing that that behavior isn't the same, it's certainly, as the open source world. But when you bring those open source concepts into the corporate world, it solves problems that are there. Yeah. Um, and it solves them. So again, that's, that's what we're hearing back. Yeah. And uh, uh, also, on top of that, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, remember that you know your your team needs to be welcoming to contributions. You know, don't be surprised by contributions. Like, review them and 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 respond in a timely fashion. It's kind of like in open source, of course, right? And, and probably my experience, at least, is that it's way more harder to get contributions in an inner source environment than in open source because of all of the business constraints around time, budget, resources, whatever. Uh, so then the more you are able to lower the barriers to make that happen, uh, you know, hackathons, meetings, meetups, public meetings, uh, public, sorry, technical discussions, et cetera, et cetera, the better, more chances that you may get those, those contributions. Excellent row of question yeah, answers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Patrick Evan Amadeus. So we, our code in Amadeus is open to all, most of the code. Uh, there's no silos in that sense. And we do try in our source on, on for some parts of what we do, especially for framework parts. But most of the time it's uh, in our source on existing projects with an existing team that is sort of bottleneck and we, so the difficulty in regarding the behavior or stuff you mentioned, what from what I observe is that th that team that is in charge, officially in charge of a framework and, and more experts in the question of your brain is not big enough, is willing to accept contributions, but in the end ends up most doing most of the work as 
reviewer of contributions of others and end up being very frustrated with not being able to take this f the, 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 the product, the framework forward. So how do you suggest to find the right balance here? Um, because that's, that's been one of the issue, main issue we, we faced. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so that is a very interesting problem. It, it almost seems like a luxury problem, you know, because <laughs> most inner source projects don't ever get to that point where they get so many contributions that they're overwhelmed. That's just something we have, we see in open source, of course. Yeah, a lot of the maintainers of popular open source projects uh, spend three quarters or more of their time just reviewing things they get. In inner source, so haven't really heard much of that. Okay, but so f for one, they, yeah, they should consider themselves actually lucky because they're so popular and get so many requests. And then what to do about it is, okay, one thing would be maybe get more manpower in the team, but another and I think better solution and more sustainable <coughs> solution is if somebody's very engaging, ask them to become a maintainer, like, uh, you know, maybe devote some of their time to be a maintainer. Yeah, because that's usually the bottleneck in open source projects as well. And uh, as I said, inner source, I, I haven't really heard much of that. But if so, you know, involve them more. Say, hey, you've been so kind and so helpful, contributing so much. Can you also please help us review some of the things that other people say? You know, and if you get, if you do that with a more with a few people, maybe that could help. Understood. That's, yeah, kind of like in open source, you know, um, involve them more in the decision and the, the cheese interface. Also tell them, hey, look, the community has great ideas. Let's give them a voice as well. There's another question back there. So, hi, uh, could you maybe share some, some tips on how to prepare teams that are becoming an inner source project uh, to be that? I mean, uh, before we were sitting in our silos uh, feeling like the heroes because we built that great app or whatever, um, and now we are going inner source. So can you share something about how we can prepare ourselves to be welcoming uh, for contributions? Well, I mean, so there, there's there's a there's a lot of great documentation, I think, on the inner source common site. So I, I'll, I'll point you to that because there's, there's a lot to cover there. Um, the and the inner source common site has training as well that can be given to people to help clarity. I think is the first thing around roles is a, is a very important first thing. Um, but there's, they also have apart from the learning um, content that's on inner source commons, they have a patterns practice, which is a whole load of ideas about practices to solve particular problems. So there are some dedicated to getting started with inner source that I think would be good to, to actually put in. But from my experience, again, hearing many of the stories of people getting started, some of the important things are clarity of role, um, things like documentation, basic documentation, because otherwise you're going to be mired down by dealing with each thing individually. So you kind of have to get that started. Um, and then kind of the community role, so the idea of education and advocacy and just holding, like I was speaking to one uh, chap who was doing it, and he had something like, I mean, they're in an organization of about 8,000 developers, but they were, they were holding their team meetings openly. So they would actually invite everyone to come along once a week to hear their discussions, to have, to be public about their discussions about the architecture framework and things like that. So it was opening up more than just the code. It was opening up their process, not even if they didn't have time to write it down, just by allowing people who are interested to come along and hear it. Um, so some things like that are just kind of small, small changes that people can make to enable them to understand the, the, I suppose, the, the challenges that are ahead of them and also then to identify potential people who'd be interested in contributing. I suppose they're just some ideas. And uh, so <laughs> adding to that, the inner source commons trainings are very recommended. And for you in particular, you, you know that we also have an internal, he works in the same company. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Plant. <laughs> and and uh, the, so our inner source training as well. Yeah. You also know very good. We hear. Okay. <laughs> 
Perhaps yeah. one more thing. I mean, what, what we learned, at least uh, very painfully in my shop, is that you need central support for inner source. You can't go without it, really, because then <laughs> it will. Yeah. Well, good for good for you. Anyway, uh, in my opinion, the job of the people working in this inner source program office or whatever you call it is to support the practitioners. That's the the form prime, the most important job, even I think, coaching and consulting. So, get some support. Ask the guys yeah. to work with you along, similar to what an agile coach would do, I guess. It's it's a lot about listening to others and join um, and join the community, of course, that Claire mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely, so <laughs> it's, it's a lot about. Um, setting up expectations, what Claire said. It's about having clear rules and guidelines. And then once all of this is there, it's about asking directly the people, do you feel comfortable? What is what you need? And then it's about having a central place that helping you to, to, to skill up the people, to move them forward in their careers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. We are we are out of time now. So well, thank you, uh, everyone that came here, to our panelists. Uh, thank you for enjoy. Have Thanks, a wonderful guys. day. Yeah. <laughs>